Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Bearing Tradition, Reproductive Metaphors and Ethnic Nationalism in Irish Traditional Music with Dr. Tess Leminski as speaker and Dr. Aileen Delan as respondent and moderator. I'm Sarah McKibben, Associate Professor of Irish Language and Literature here at uh, the University of Notre Dame and a fellow of the Keo Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, the sponsor of today's webinar. I'm also concurrent faculty in gender studies, our par partner and co-sponsor today. Thank you to Gender Studies and to other offices at Notre Dame, including the new initiative on race and resilience, which helped promote today's event. We are very much looking forward to Dr. Slominski's talk and eager to hear from you, the audience. You are able to use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen to send in questions at any time during the talk. And um, Dr. Jalan will uh, moderate them at, after, um, after the talk. All right, our moderator, Dr. Aileen Delan, will introduce you to our speaker, but it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Delan. Aileen Delan is senior lecturer at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick. She is an ethnomusicologist, global Irish music specialist, and scholar of popular music with research interests in ethnicity, identity, nationalism, and cosmopolitanism in the traditional and popular musics of Ireland, the UK, North America, and Australia. She is also a musician herself, um, playing the traditional flute, tin whistle, piano, and keyboards, and a member of the All-Ireland winning uh, Temple Glanton Cayley Band, and a former member of the Chicago-based band, Anish. Dr. Delan earned her undergraduate degree from University College Cork, her master's degree from the University of Limerick and her doctorate from the University of Chicago, where she was a Century Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. In addition to teaching at Limerick, she is involved in several research clusters and projects, two of which are Festiversities, a new three-year funded project along with four other European partners exploring European music festivals, public spaces, and cultural diversity. And a second project I'm just gonna highlight briefly, Power, Discourse, and Society Research Cluster at the University of Limerick, an interdisciplinary research cluster in the Faculty of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Um, and that she's a, and that's a, a project uh, for which she is the co-founder and the co-director. All right, I had the pleasure of getting to know um, Aileen when she visited us here at the Keo Nocton Institute for the fall 2017 semester to research and teach. And I'm delighted to welcome her back virtually today. Thank you, Aileen, for moderating today's webinar and take it away. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. I'm very pleased um, to see so many uh, names and familiar names in the um, attendance today. Um, and I'm even more pleased to be in a position to introduce to you the wonderful fiddle player and extraordinary scholar, Dr. Tess um, Slominski, whom I've known for a long time and whose work I, I admire deeply because she's been at the cutting edge in particular of gender studies, but even more recently, um, race and um, sexual identity in, in Irish traditional music. So Tess is currently the interim uh, administrative director for the Rare Books Schools Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Uh, Bibliography in Charlottesville, Virginia. That's where she is right now. Prior to that, uh, Tess was a professor in Beloit um, for seven years and um, she uh, received her PhD from NYU and she also studied for a master's at the University of Limerick. Unfortunately, our paths didn't cross then, but they've crossed plenty of times since. Um, Tess is a really um, impressive um, uh, CV in terms of the kinds of work she's doing at the moment, especially in relation to gender studies. She's co-editing a very extensive revision of the gender and sexuality content of the Grove Music Online for Oxford University Press, which is the go-to source for musicologists, ethnomusicologists, and many other people besides. So this is a really important and responsible position, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, more of those entries uh, come out. Tess in particular is being celebrated today um, for her book, which came out last year prior to the pandemic, which in many ways was unfortunate uh, because she didn't get her chance to go and do her tour and promote it. But I'm really glad the Keown Nocton Institute for Irish Studies has created this space because there are many uh, traditional music scholars and gender scholars and musicians chomping at the bit to have these kinds of exchanges. And Tess is the person with whom we need to be doing this. So uh, Tess has an article in the yearbook uh, for traditional uh, music that came out in 2020 and her most current article is in Ethnomusicology Ireland, a very special edition on women in Irish music um, following a conference in NUIG in Galway 
on um, women in music and the fair play movement. Um, and so that um, edition has been uh, co-edited uh, by a number of scholars in this area, Maeveni Urahan, Una Monaghan, um, Verena Commons, and uh, it's, oh, Sheila Denver. All of these scholars um, are working in the area of um, traditional music and gender in particular, um, and have drawn heavily uh, and looked to Tess who gave the keynote at that conference. So again, deeply embedded in these discussions um, <clears throat> right now. So Tess is a newly minted board member of the Milwaukee um, uh, Irish Music Archive, which is uh, in Wisconsin and which has fabulous resources and she'll be doing great work with the board um, and connecting with um, universities and other um, archives in that respect. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, if it comes to traditional music and, and gender, Tess has been there for, for a long time doing this and her, her more recent uh, moves into the areas around in particular race are really critical interventions. And we have an enormous lot to, to learn from. Uh, Tess, um, these topics are sometimes not easy, particularly for musicians in the traditional music community, um, but her book, um, really explores these in great depth methodologically and theoretically and so today Tess is going to uh, take us more into the um, lived experiences and the material reality of um, of the lives of musicians who are excluded and feel excluded and uh, that kind of intervention is crucial particularly in this moment in time so Tess um, on behalf of the Kilnaughton Institute and everybody's here today uh, warmly uh, welcome you and we look forward both to your um, paper and to the questions afterwards. So thank you, Tess. Thank you so much, Aileen. Um, I'm so glad that's getting recorded because I'm glad to have, I will be glad to have a recording of it. Uh, all those lovely things. I am currently trying to figure out how to get rid of my own picture. And I think the best way to do that is by sharing my PowerPoint. So, um, but thank you, Aileen, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. And to Sarah, whom I just met today, miraculously enough, you'd think our paths would have crossed by now. And I'm delighted that this event is being co-sponsored by Irish Studies and by Gender Studies. That's, that's exactly where I live, uh, as, as Aileen points out. And uh, I do want to say to the Gender Studies folks in the audience, I'm definitely doing the intersectionality thing today. Uh, how could I not? Uh, but I will be focusing a little bit more on the race facets of intersectionality. Uh, but you can't have one without the other. So gender and sexuality are definitely here. In my book, I lay out an argument that is quite easy to articulate, but much harder to solve. That ethnic nationalism works against attempts for equality and equity in Irish traditional music, and that its exclusions and violences disproportionately affect women, LGBTQ plus mu musicians, and musicians of color. This argument is much harder to accept, given the weight of centuries of history and the often subtle yet overwhelming array of cultural products and linguistic practices that delineate who can sound Irish and who can be Irish and who cannot. This argument has profound implications for Irish traditional music as well as for Irish identity at home and abroad. In the book, I use stories taken from archival research into early 20th century women musicians and accounts from present day musicians to build this argument. And I theorize it using a range of ideas from feminist, queer, and critical race theory, as well as from music and sound studies. To give you a sense of the variety of thinkers the book engages with, here are a few. Adriana Cavarero, Suzanne Cusick, Jose Munoz, Alexander Wahilie, Vladimir uh, Yankelevich, and Carolyn Abate. Many of your favorite Irish historians make appearances, as do Irish music scholars like Gerard O'Halloran and Helen O'Shea. But today I'm leaving those theorists and historians backstage, present but ceding the stage to the musicians without whom this project would not exist. The first challenge is, of course, the realization that there is a problem. As with so many other problems of exclusion, it is entirely obvious to those it most keenly affects, but often difficult for others to perceive, let alone accept. So in a second, let's watch a video from 2011. I chose it because it is clearly staged to promote sessions in Cork City. 
Someone intentionally set up the cameras and gathered these players at a particular time outside normal session time. And judging from the players' drink choices, I would bet that this session is happening before lunchtime. In a move that's kind of uncharacteristic for me, I would like you all to pay attention to the visual information, including the camera work. So Tim, if you can take away the Lee Sessions video. I love that video so much, even though I like to pick it apart in some really um, pretty picky ways. Um, this is a very rich text with lots of information. For example, we could talk about the choice of tunes. Is the middle tune, Trip to Cullenstown, a subtle tribute to Seamus Cray, who shaped the musical life of Cork City in profound ways and died in 2009? Uh, there, there's just so many things we could talk about here. Uh, whoops, and I went to my slide too soon. Um, one of the most obvious characteristics of this video and the event it represents is the absence of women musicians. Much to my surprise, 
One of the commenters on YouTube recognizes this absence, usually it goes unremarked, and writes, not too bad, and I think there's nearly as many women as men performing Irish trad, but no women here. What is this, the Iranian Republic of Cork? The dearth of women is notable, but not because women are overwhelmingly present in all other contexts in which Irish traditional music is played. I could condemn the Lee Sessions organizers for not including more women, but it probably didn't even occur to them that they had assembled an all-male session, since so many informal sessions are. We could draw a parallel with academic panels. Gender trouble in Irish trad is a much bigger problem, and the pictures displayed behind the musicians give a sense of how consistently this genre privileges the contributions of male musicians. The occasional use of black and white filter reinforces a sense of tradition, history, and timelessness. It suggests that this performance, these tunes, and these players are as they always have been and always will be. Let's think more about the women and children who are present. Most likely they're family members of one of the male musicians. Are they musicians themselves? I don't know, though it's entirely possible given that many musicians choose to marry other musicians and that multiple siblings often play traditional music. Without knowing them though, we can only speculate. But what does their presence in the video do? For one thing, it reinforces the idea that men play and women merely listen. But the message and the history here go far deeper. Early 20th century Irish newspaper columns argued that women could best help the fight for Irish independence by raising their children, especially their sons, to be good Irish citizens, steeped in the culture of the land and ready to protect it. As I discuss in my book, this connection between women, domesticity, and cultural nationalism provided opportunities for working class and middle class women musicians to perform on nationalist stages between the founding of the Gaelic League in 1893 and Irish independence in 1922. But that window of opportunity was brief and the 1937 constitution established in written law that a woman's place was in the home, bearing and raising children. And remember that the infamous marriage bar that prevented married women from holding civil service posts, including teaching positions, was only repealed in 1973. Further complicating women's participation in public life is that pubs, where much traditional music making has happened since the 1960s, have not always been accessible to women. Up until the 1980s in some places, women were implicitly or explicitly prohibited from entering pubs or were relegated to certain rooms, often tellingly a room known as the kitchen. Since 2003, people under the age of 18 have not been permitted in premises that serve alcohol after 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. in the summer, a change in the law that represents a de facto obstacle to the participation of women with school-aged children, since most sessions begin at 10 p.m. It's worth noting that traditional musicians particularly objected to this law, largely on behalf of underage musicians, since pub sessions are one of the primary means for the transmission of Irish traditional music. And as I remember, the uproar was focused on the rights of underage musicians, rather than on removing barrier, barriers to their mother's participation. This question of transmission brings me to the presence of children in the audience. Again, I'm less concerned with these particular children than with the way that their presence reinforces ideals of generational transmission and Irish traditional music as tied to heteronormative family structures and the genealogical lineages they often, but not always, produce. In Irish traditional music, the gold standard of musical transmission is from parent to child. And although many male musicians talk about learning tunes from their mothers, male tradition bearers dominate the historical record. My recent ar article in Ethnomusicology Ireland talks much more extensively about the gendering of the term tradition bearer. But here, I would like to highlight two points. First, in the Irish context, tradition bearer is a slippery term that has almost always resulted in the erasure of women musicians. When it refers to a wo woman, the ideal tradition bearer passes the tradition along to her son, usually, almost always, in fact, a son, largely unchanged. Her musicianship and role in shaping the music she transmits are considered unremarkable. And in fact, any changes she might um, create in the music are, are often 
often actually not, uh, not taken very well. Second, the term tradition bearer references the act of burying actual human children. It invokes current realities of biological reproduction through which anatomical and phenotypical characteristics are transmitted. These characteristics are the ones we use to construct ideas about sex, race, and ethnicity. Slippages between biology and metaphor raise the stakes of these questions. By linking the transmission of culture to genetic transmission, the metaphor of tradition bearing is dangerously, dangerously close to suggesting that certain physical bodies can or cannot participate in traditional practice. That leads me to consider the banjo player at the far left of our screen, Hajime Takahashi, who is well known in the Irish traditional music scene in Japan. Thanks to his placement on the edge of the session and the camera person's preference for other close-ups, his ethnicity is not obvious here. In fact, neither is his gender. The first time I watched this video, up until the end, I imagined he might be a male Irish hippie of the kind I was used to see. I used to see most often busking in Cork or Galway, which just goes to show that even though I think and write a lot about ethnicity, I can also fall into ingrained ways of thinking that lead me to try to interpret a Japanese musician as Irish to make him better fit my expectations of an Irish session player rather than the reality in front of my face. In any case, his fairly laddish body language playing the banjo is characteristic of some male Irish players, and musically he fits. There's nothing to distinguish his musical performance or body language from that of any of the ethnically Irish musicians sitting around the table. There's a moment at the end of the video when it seems he might actually be a woman, judging from the cut of his shirt, but he's not. I would argue that Takuhashi's gender ambiguity here diverts audience perceptions away from his ethnicity, because surprisingly, for YouTube commenters anyway, it goes mostly unremarked, even though his name is listed in the credits at the end of the video. So let's spend a moment with those commenters, which of course y'all can't see because of the, the realities of Zoom, but don't worry, I'll share. Viewer feedback on this video is largely positive and includes questions about the names of tunes, excitement about attending sessions in Cork, and of course, the requisite reference to that scene in the Titanic movie. A predictable thread emerges linking Irish culture to genetic heritage usually to claim a connection with the sounds and images the video presents. This is the Irish spirit. Brilliant, thanks a million. My granddad was from Ireland. I just love the lively traditional music, happy music. My granddad was born in Cork. He fled in 1912 and had three sons. I'll be back, no worries about that, I'll be back. And brilliant. Love the Irish music, and even more now I'd done my family history and found out I always had the feeling I have Irish blood in me. And then my favorite, which is simply, I am a Hegarty. It's worth noting here that none of the names of the pubs listed at the, bot at the ba bottom banner of the video include Hegarty's pub, so this really is rather a non sequitur. It all seems harmless enough and certainly much kinder than the internet often is. But the assumption that genetic heritage has something to do with musical taste or ability leads to dire exclusions and the threat of violence. That Hajime Takahashi has so far emerged unscathed from YouTube commenters on this video is either pure luck or the result of care careful comment moderation. Now, I want us to think about Irish traditional music as a site with many opportunities for slippage between cultural nationalism and ethnic nationalism. Although most of the examples I provide here occurred in the US, they demonstrate the kinds of reactions musicians of color face anywhere white anxieties about an imagined Irish ethnic purity emerge. These anxieties are necessarily also anxieties about sex and gender, since ethnic purity is only possible with complete control of reproduction and therefore control over the sexual activities of both men and women. Right now, I do not seek to investigate the source of these white, anx white anxieties or to delve too deeply into things like Irish immigration policies, the eugenics movement, or reproductive legislation in Ireland, 
even though I also want to make sure those ideas are in the room here today. Instead, I want to share stories that contextualize my earlier comment that it's remarkable that Hajime Takahashi's presence in the Lee Sessions video so far has not elicited racist vitriol, even if the video overall has triggered the kind of romanticized ethnic heritage fantasies that Irish tourism banks on, which was quite possibly one of the aims of the video. One of the effects of these fantasies of ethnic heritage is that white musicians are understood as Irish or of Irish descent until proved otherwise, and sometimes even if proved otherwise, and musicians of color are not, whatever the realities of each person's genetic heritage. For white musicians from outside Ireland, Irishness can be a moving target, claimed by descent, but often presumed based on musical style and associations. For example, people in the trad scene tend to assume that my mother must be Irish or Irish American. Such presumed Irish judgments, which benefit white musicians tremendously in smoothing social relationships and in getting gigs, are never bestowed on musicians whose racial difference is visible. For musicians of color with Irish heritage, claiming their Irish ethnicity in public can feel like acquiescing to the racist assumption that a musician must have a direct genetic connection with Ireland to play right, or even to have the right to play, as Henry, an Asian American musician, points out. Quote, I will say to people often that my mother's Irish American, sometimes just to diffuse the conversation, because I just don't want to have it. Sometimes just to see, like, what's the reaction going to be? Like, oh, okay, that suddenly make, now makes sense. So you play Irish music, end quote. The intelligibility that results from pointing out Irish heritage demonstrates the extent to which whiteness, perceived musical ability, and one's right to musical and sonic space are enmeshed. But emphasizing an Irish parent to avoid being silenced musically, literally or rhetorically, can do other damage. By inviting others to see one as part white, one's experience of living in the world and in the trad scene as a person of mixed race is rendered either unspeakable or the topic of speculation, as in this conversation between African-American fiddler and singer Rhiannon Giddens, winner of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and Renee Montaigne, a reporter for National Public Radio. So Renee Montaigne says, well, I know you've recorded songs in Gaelic. Is that in your tradition? I mean, your name Rhiannon is a Welsh name from mythology. Yeah, my mother was reading Welsh mythology when I was born and decided to name me Rhiannon. That definitely got me interested in sort of Celtic culture and stuff. But you know, that whole idea of, is it my culture? It gets asked of me in a way that white people who do blues don't get asked. I actually thought it might actually be your culture. There might be a connection. Well, that's the thing. Whether or not, whether I am or not, like, that's my point. I don't know all of my genealogy, but my point is that if music speaks to you, I think that you have the ability to do that. Giddens gently points out the inequity inherent in asking non-white musicians about their genetic connections to a genre when white musicians are not subject to the same kind of questioning. Moreover, although there are many reasons a person might not be able to trace their genealogy, White listeners are obliged to remember that slavery and the sexual violence of oppression often result in gaps in genealogical knowledge or complicated identifications with gen genetic heritage. But Trad's connection with ethnic nationalism suggests that non-ethnically Irish musicians should disidentify with part or all of their family's heritage to identify with the genre. Given Trad's widespread appeal to listeners, it may surprise some readers that non-white musicians are constantly asked to explain their presence in ways that range from curious to hostile. Every single musician of color I interviewed for my book talked about the predictable and incessant expressions of disbelief they face from new people. How did you get into this? Is how the question goes. Missy, an African-American fiddle player who now focuses on other genres, emphasizes the inevitability of the question. Quote, no matter where I was, eventually somebody would ask me, what's a black girl like you doing playing this music? 
end quote. Many musicians of color experience this question as a microaggression because it feels inescapable, a constant reminder that some see trad as the property of ethnically Irish people. Henry talks about a live radio spot he did with one of his bands when the host voiced this kind of race-based disbelief. Quote, it was myself and three clearly white guys, but none of them Irish either. But the host did the whole thing of, I know why you three guys play trad, but why do you play Irish music? And like you're on the air, and so it was that particular kind of infuriating, end quote. However harmless such questions might seem to the person asking them, they expose the essentialist fantasy that only certain bodies might be able to produce appropriate sounds and social behaviors. Sometimes race policing happenings in, happens in more menacing ways, as in Henry's account of being confronted by an Irish American listener who asked, quote, what gives you the right to play our music? And then his story of a group of skinheads writing his band, which included Henry and a Jewish musician, a menacing cease and desist note at a gig in the Pacific Northwest. This belief that music and dance are expressions of genetic heritage might seem harmless when audience members ask white musicians about their family backgrounds, but it represents a dangerous illogic that drives white supremacy, that skin color, religion, sexuality, and other forms of difference determine one's abilities and aptitudes and thus one's humanity. Disbelief that a non-Irish person might be a skilled trad musician can masquerade as a more socially acceptable form of this kind of racism which emerges more overtly in African-American fiddler Esme's story about searching for a teacher in a large metropolitan area in the United States with a vibrant trad scene. She says, quote, these are just people who have prejudices. So let's take an Irish person who comes to the US, who's a marvelous musician, like he has prejudices. He starts teaching a lot of students and he passes along his prejudices and says, there are certain people who cannot learn this music and there are certain people who can. And he begins to share his music with the people who he feels he can share it with, and he won't share it with others. So those students take those ideas with them to the session." End quote. Despite a great deal of effort, Esme never found a local teacher willing to take her on as a student. She was driven and lucky enough to be able to address this problem in part by attending festivals at, classes at festivals elsewhere in the US and by going to Ireland tactics that require resources and time. And like other musicians of color, she reports a warmer reception among musicians in Ireland than she has experienced at home. Traditional musicians of East Asian descent face essentialist discrimination when others assert that where they really belong is in classical music. As with other manifestations of racism, external fa factors drive this presumption. In addition to widespread education in Western art music in East Asia, the West has long fetishized Asian bodies, especially women's bodies, in its consumption of virtuosic classical performance. Grace, an Asian American musician, connects gender and ethnicity in describing her experience in the trad scene. Quote, one of the most depressing things about Irish music to me is like, you go to these things and it's 99% white people and they treat me like I'm a cute little girl. Oh, your feet, it looks like you're a dancer. And then it's always, how did you get involved in blah, 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 blah. You know, I get it because you never would have said that if I was playing Beethoven for some reason. Like you would never have said that because Midori happened, end quote. Grace is an established performer with decades of experience as a professional musician. And to her chagrin, being perceived as cute complete with the stereotypical and creepy attention to her feet, generates approval at the cost of being taken seriously. And as we have seen far too often and far too recently, the fetishization of Asian women is not innocent or harmless, and at times it is deadly. And we haven't yet talked about the model minority myth in the context of Irish traditional music, but it's time. Henry turns the stereotype of the Asian classical musician around to express wonder at the universalism attached to Western art music and the particularity ascribed to Western vernacular musics. When he asks, quote, do people ask Yo-Yo Ma why he plays Italian music or German music 
Would they ever ask that? Like, what is it about Irish music that makes it so race-based? End quote. This double critique reminds us that the roots of art music and Western imperialism are deep, and that the importance of nationalist sentiments in music from Europe's fringes, including the music of composers like Bartok and Sibelius, is itself a result of imperialist power relationships that continue to shape music performance, composition, reception, and scholarship. The assumption that musicians of Asian descent must be classical musicians also obscures the imperialism that brought Western art music to Japan, China, Korea, and elsewhere. Indeed, if childhood exposure to Irish, Scottish, and English so-called folk melodies grants any legitimacy as an Irish traditional music musician, Japanese musicians have as valid a claim to this familiarity as many white traddies, since songs like Auld Lang Syne were incorporated into standardized education during the Meiji period of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And if anybody's interested in this, um, Sean Williams has a great article about this. Disbelief that non-white people might be passionate and valued members of traditional music scenes in Ireland and elsewhere does material as well as epistemic and ontological damage to both non-normative musicians and the scene more generally. Althusser's concept of interpolation provides a use, use, useful framework for thinking about recognition as an external force that can enable or prevent access to the scene. The contrast between African-American fiddler Esme's and my experiences with police and immigration officials demonstrates how racism operates in determinations of who can and cannot be an Irish traditional musician, how local and national attitudes toward race threaten access, create material hardship, and ultimately jeopardize individual subjectivity, since traditional musicians are often who we are, rather than merely just what we are. By now, the excessive policing of non-white and especially black bodies in white spaces is well established, and ease of access is not a given in the predominantly white spaces where sessions and concerts are usually held in majority white countries. Esme, who grew up in an affluent white neighborhood in the United States and attended schools where she was the only black student, has experienced frequent and intrusive police attention in the U.S. She describes encounters with police officers who assumed that she was an interloper in her own neighborhood, someone who, even as a child and teenager, ostensibly posed a threat to the white residents of her town for such nefarious activities as riding her bike and waiting for the bus. By contrast, she finds the Irish Gardaí much more subtle. Even though she says she knows that she's being watched, Irish munici municipal police rarely approach her in ways that would threaten her life or damage her sense of agency. Immigration officials are another story, however. Gaining entry into Ireland has not always been easy for her, even when she had been accepted into a graduate music program in Ireland. Her way of telling the story demonstrates how an immigration officer's blatant refusal to recognize her as a musician and a human struck a deep blow to her senses of bodily integrity and personhood. Quote, I got accepted and had all my paperwork. I had all my banking statements and I put it all in a big folder and I got on a plane and I landed in Ireland. The immigration officer asked me, so what are you here for? And I said, well, I've been accepted to university. And he just said, I don't believe you. And I literally started trembling and my mouth started watering. Like the lights all started to go out. And he said, go sit over there. And I sat there until every single plane landed that day before he came over or anyone came over and assisted me. And then he said, I need all your paperwork. He went through every single paper. I sat there for an hour and he came back and started asking me questions. So you play Irish music. He said he was a flute player and he would be watching me. He would be watching me. Yeah. And so he stamped my passport that I had to leave the country four days after the last class. Four days. I had four days to leave the country after the course ended. Already undone, 
by having been interpolated as an illegitimate presence in Ireland by an agent of the state, Esme's subjectivity as a traditional musician was even more devastatingly undone when the immigration officer identified himself as a flute player. The immigration officer's disbelief at the legitimacy of a black woman playing fiddle at a high enough level to be admitted to an Irish graduate program was enough for him to choose to use his power to change the routine procedure of issuing a student visa to cut Esme's stay in Ireland from the standard two years she was entitled to under the law to one year and 11 days. Esme left Ireland at the end of her course and returned at considerable expense to attend her graduation, but not before another soul, time, and money-consuming abuse at the hands of another immigration officer who said, quote, you expect me to believe that you're here for graduation? Understandably, Esme experienced this interpolation as a bad subject, uh, as another physical assault. And she says, quote, I'm telling you, it was like a complete loss of blood. Everything in my body was draining out of me, and I couldn't even speak. It was just such a desperate experience, end quote. My own immigration story is very different. I was treated cordially and granted a stay several months longer than the duration of my master's program to sightsee, according to the immigration officer who processed my paperwork at the same airport where Esme was later denied the time she was legally entitled to. During my official check-ins with the immigration office in the same city where Esme was in school, officials overtly hailed me as a fellow white person and their diatribes against the Nigerian clients in the waiting room. This privilege meant that my visits to the immigration office were brief and uncomplicated, however uncomfortable I was as a young foreign student who did not feel able to speak up on behalf of my African counterparts. This kind of race-based interpolation has benefited me in countless ways, and despite occasional quizzings by cranky immigration officers, I have never doubted that I would be admitted to Ireland. Esme's encounters with these immigration officers, however, have resulted in limited entry stamps in her passport that she worries may jeopardize her admittance to other countries. So my argument against the enforced singularities of ethnic nationalism comes in part from the study of Irish history, which exposes the illogic of a popular post-colonialism that has built for itself a house using the master's flawed tools of ethnic nationalism even as it has been quick to enumerate the wrongs perpetrated by its colonizer. But considering the stories of musicians of color and Irish traditional music makes the flaws in ethnic nationalism audible because we are forced to consider just what makes music Irish. Is it the particular timbre of a fiddler slurring certain notes to produce just the right rhythmic lift? Is it the creation of a community around a shared love of certain combinations of notes? Is it based in patterns of sociability, in meandering stories about musicians long gone, shared around cups of tea or pints of stout? Or is it based in genetic heritage or what passport someone holds? So, for example, how might we understand this song and its performance? And Tim, if you can take away the video again. So this is, I call it the Vex things, although it would probably be easier to call it, have you got a girlfriend yet? Because that's the most memorable line. <laughs> so, mostly true story. Uh, I kissed a boy and it was a joy, oh I loved him very well. But her playful sport, it was cut too short by the toll of the morning bell. And then one day my nanai calls, and this is what she said. Oh dear, oh dear, my dearest dear, have you got a girlfriend yet? No highs, hellos, or how have you been? Just the vexings you beget. For it's every damn time you see my face, you'll say, have you got a girlfriend yet? 
Well, I set my course and I headed up north for to fiddle all night and day. And maybe meet a fella who could sing a cappella or could step so blithe and gay. And then one day my Tito calls and this is what he said. Oh dear, oh dear, my dearest dear, have you got a girlfriend yet? No highs, hellos, or how have you been? Just the vexings you beget. For it's every damn time you see my face, you'll say, Have you got a girlfriend yet? Well, I met my man down in the downtown for to ramble and rove all day. And all the ladies, they'd sigh, throw a shady side eye. What a waste, what a waste, they'd say. And then one day my Lola calls, and this is what she said. Oh dear, oh dear, my dearest dear, have you got a girlfriend yet? No highs, hellos, or how have you been? Just the vexings you beget. For it's every damn time you see my face, you'll say, have you got a girlfriend yet? Well, my schooling's done, and I've had my fun, and I call Rhode Island home. I have pleasures and pursuits, and I've put down my roots, and my life, it is my own. Then here comes you, somebody new. I guess you knew me then, and then you'll Say, oh dear, my dearest dear, have you got a girlfriend yet? No highs, hellos, or how have you been? Just the vexings you beget. For it's every damn time you see my face, you'll say, have you got a girlfriend yet? Armand is a luthier and a lovely fiddle player in the Irish tradition, and with his partner Ben Gagliardi, a member of the band The Vox Hunters. Here, in singing about what Adrian Rich calls compulsory heterosexuality, he refuses the conventions of genetic reproduction in the song's meaning, but embraces cultural reproduction in the use of formulaic phrases like my dearest dear, as well as in his melodic structure and singing style. And I could go into the musical particulars here, but I'll, I'll spare y'all. Um, Armand is both producing and reproducing what I would call Irish or perhaps Irish American music, since he is fully embedded in the Irish traditional music scene in the US. His lyrics ex explicitly establish his Filipino heritage by using Tagalog words for his relatives. But as is common in Irish and other traditional musics, Armin encourages others to learn the song and adapt it. In his blurb on the YouTube video, he writes, quote, by all means, please do learn it and feel free to change the honorifics to whatever is most relatable. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, that's all very nice, but really, this is an American of Filipino descent. How on earth would you call him Irish? And I freely admit that Irishness is not mine to bestow on anyone. So, uh, is it really anybody's? What I do hope is to nudge us closer to a more expansive understanding of cultural belonging rather than restrictive and exclusive nationalisms based on ethnicity, nationalisms that so frequently lead to violence. And how might, how might we interpret this performance if Armand happened to be an Irish citizen and one of the approximately 16,000 Filipinos living in Ireland? perhaps the son of a nurse recruited from the Philippines by the Irish government in the late 1990s. This question exposes profound gaps between citizenship and national belonging for anyone who seems not to match the ethnicity of their country of residence. As an American writing and playing music during a continuing era of destruction, destructive nationalism, which I would argue is not over yet, despite the positive election outcomes this year, I believe that many of today's problems come from outdated investments in identity as an essential inherent characteristic, rather than as a construction that changes in response to encounters with other people, musics, and contexts. This should not be a revolutionary claim, but it is. Such investments in essentialized identities are not just Irish or American or Irish-American problems, of course, 
and my argument for the separation of sounds and social practices from ethnicity applies well beyond Ireland and its diaspora. Instead, let us find new tools for understanding music making and identity formation outside the parameters of embodied ethnicity that enclose national and cultural belonging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tess, for a very uh, thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, there are many people in the audience, I know, that will have been thinking about these issues and they're working um, in these areas. I'm going to keep my um, response pretty brief because I'm conscious we have to finish up at three or eight o'clock in GMT time. So while I'm speaking for the next uh, couple of minutes, can I encourage those of you who may have questions to put them into the queue and um, Q&A box? The first thing I'd like to say um, about this presentation by Tess, by Dr. Sleminski, is that um, it foregrounds experiences. Um, and in the anthropological and ethnomusicological world, the importance of uh, the, the individual experience, not to draw large scale um, uh, reductions about society in general, is crucial simply because everyone's experience counts as a partial truth. And together we build those truths as we reveal them. So in focusing methodologically on these experiences by, um, you know, the various um, interviewees that Tess engages with, it's bringing it right down to the human level, to the somatic and the felt level. And these stories need to be heard before we start doing um, the kinds of sophisticated uh, methodological uh, analysis that Tess does. So first we need to hear and not be defensive, and then we need to think. And from there we can critique, and absolutely we welcome critique um, on this paper. Um, so in a sense then, Tess is uh, three levels. There's gender, there's uh, sexual orientation or sexual identity, and there's race. And uh, she's uh, dealt with particularly gender and race in this respect, but has also in other papers dealt with um, uh, sexual orientation as well, particularly in terms of how it is to be out in a session or not. Now, in terms of race, we must remember that race is a social construct. It's not something that's 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 real, but you feel it and you experience it um, structurally, as in the case of, of Esme. So some of the things we need to think about is this kind of pathology of discrimination. Is this simply at a, a societal level in Ireland and in the US and everywhere else? Is, is, is the manifestation in Irish traditional music practice and discourse simply echoing what's happening to society at large? Or can we also identify within the, um, the Irish traditional music scenes and the many multiple scenes there are in the current moment, a sort of an underpinning ideology driven by all the things Tess acknowledged in terms of discourses around heteronormativity, uh, the emergence of the free state in relation to a very sort of gendered normative identity, um, the kind of uh, representation of Ireland as feminine and colonized and therefore post-colonially the idea that uh, one can talk about being the oppressed and therefore not consider in many ways how that oppression is reproduced. So these are historical uh, things that Tess is bringing up. But of course, um, what's so interesting is today, this morning, Tess, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, the Why Not Her um, uh, research group published reports on um, the playing of women musicians in Ireland in the singles and the charts between 2010 and 2019. And women represented 10.0 or 11.0 percent of the airplay. And the rest of the airplay was pretty much by uh, white male musicians. So, so as historical as some, as some of these discourses may be, as Tess says, they're absolutely relevant to the current times. And I see researchers in the audience, people like Marta Cook, people like Anne-Marie Hanlon, uh, people like Joanne Cusack, who are really dealing with the gender side of this in their work uh, through Fair Play, through the Sounding the Feminist, through the um, uh, Misha Foster movements. And so there is an energy coalescing around all of this that needs to continue. In relation to specifically race, um, you know, you're looking at, as you pointed out, Tess, lots of minorities living in Ireland. 25% of people in Ireland currently are born outside of Ireland. So, so the idea that, um, you know, Ireland isn't uh, uh, multicultural and diverse is, is 
is simply not the case. It's a different historical trajectory to what has happened in the US and the discourses around Black Lives Matter, for example, don't translate cleanly, but they are absolutely relational. So, so what does that mean? You know, where, when we look at sessions, are the, the, the um, people of color? Where are in particular Black Irish uh, creatives? We're finding them in hip hop, we're finding them in spoken word, we're not finding them in trad. Ironically, or maybe not, maybe it makes sense, we are finding them in dance. And people like Nick Garris, who speaks to these, um, he's in the audience also, speaks to these issues, can talk to that too. Why is dance more receptive to the queer body? Why is dance more receptive to people of color than traditional music? Uh, all of us, I think, um, may have no musicians of color um, who disappear. Um, they don't, after the age of 18, they disappear from cultists, they disappear from those spaces. So why is that the case? I think Tess's analysis, invites us all to think critically about the kinds of work we can do within our own traditional music communities. And just because it doesn't apply to us, somebody said to me recently, oh, but Aileen, you're in a Kaylee band with three men and seven women. So, you know, it's clearly not misogynistic. It's like saying, well, I have a black friend, therefore I can't be racist. These are habituations that are deeply tied in many ways um, to uh, inherited practices. Now, by the same token, what we have to do critically is to distangle uh, the ideas of citizenship, the ideas of ethnicity as, ex as an expression of Irish nationalism, ethnicity as a category within Irish diasporic spheres, ethnicity as, a, as a, um, an idea, how it relates to race, and look at those in, in social and historical and political context. Because of course, Irish music is a genre and a repertoire, but because it has the appellation Irish, it completely gets continually hitched to uh, the nationalist discourse. So there are, there are positive things happening. Um, you know, Tess and I were talking last night about the concept of affinity diaspora, which is one of those spaces where people who are simply interested in Irish music for the sake of it are actually, um, you know, it's, it's a space in which to exist in that respect. And it was introduced by the president of Ireland, the wonderful uh, Michael D. Higgins. Um, and you have the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, particularly in its outreach across the various um, uh, consulate generals, um, continually promoting actually diversity. Ironically, where at the same time within Ireland, they're still not dismantling fully direct provision yet, which is where asylum seekers and often people of colour um, experience the greatest um, uh, disenfranchisement. So all of these things are, are in the mix. And, and, you know, Tess isn't prescribing that this is the one way we, we deal with or think about these things, but that we, we stand back and when we hear those lived experiences, uh, which Tess can speak to as much as any of us can, when we hear about those and we account for our privilege and also um, for when we're not privileged, when we're on the receiving end of these kinds of behaviours that are deeply ingrained and are very much conflated and mistaken and sometimes I'm arguing this in the book I'm writing at the moment actually that there is a, a sort of a pass given to Irish ethnicity well they were subjugated so you know I mean the, the white supremacist undertones to any kind of ethno-nationalist discourse is critical Sean Williams is coming out with some work on this Tess is going to be doing more work on this there are lots of people uh, engaging with these ideas. So these are just some of my, my initial kind of responses. And, and so I would, I would really commend you, Tess, in, in telling individual stories, because I know oftentimes within the sociological realm, people want the data to speak in particular ways. So the individual stories are important, um, but so too then is the extrapolation from that. And so people like Una Monaghan, who's done great work um, uh, with Fair Play and uh, in her own research, Dr. Una Monaghan, um, and, and as I said, Joanne, and a number of other people. Uh, and there are lots of scholars, I see lots of scholars in, 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 um, in, in the pack there, and also musicians. Uh, I want to hear from you, I guess. You know, here we are, we've got very, very little time. Uh, so let's go to the Q&A. Marty Fahey, how are you? The concept of Irishness has always been more fluid uh, than we were all led to believe. And it's wonderful. It's finally pulling back the covers on the concepts. We've always been invested in the them and us thinking, and it's healthy to be challenging these boundaries. So I think that's a big thumbs up for you. Emily Miller uh, wanted to know if they're recording. Yes, there is. Uh, Dan Restivo, inspiring um, uh, presentation. Absolutely. Um, 
Anybody want to query or push tests on methodologies, on analytical frames, on the work that they're currently doing? I know Tess would be very interested in hearing from those of you who are at the coalface of this uh, and working with Fair Play or, or anywhere else. Um, and I know this is only the beginning uh, in many ways, uh, guys, but it's critical because 2020, while we were all in lockdown, proved to be really challenging in relation uh, to Black Lives Matter in particular. And there was a response from the Black Irish community within Ireland. And there was um, some amazing moments where uh, Black creatives took to the stage. And there was a lot of, uh, particularly women, by the way, and Black queer women as well. And there was a lot of pushback. Um, so the creation and the opening up of these spaces is not just about uh, middle class white women. It's about everyone. It's about uh, trans women. It's about anybody who's experiencing traveler women. The Black Lives Matter movement is very much including of traveler uh, men and women, too. So, um, Sarah, you can't post in the Q&A. Do you want to have a question here? OK, there is a question for Tess coming from Sarah. I think we have time for it. Can white, white appearing musicians, what can white, white appearing musicians do, Tess, to help interrupt and change this kind of process? What are the ways of using white privilege against this process? Also, there needs to be a huge stink made of the ongoing racism of immigration offices in Ireland, says Sarah. Here, here. Uh, Tess, do you want to take that? Yeah. So, um, you know, like a lot of things, it's really easy to say and a lot harder to do when you're in the moment. Um, and, and what I'm going to say here is going to maybe feel pretty obvious. Um, if to quote the New York City subway, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. uh, this goes for gender oppressions as well as um, you know oppressions around sexuality. And so you know what happens a lot of the time, and I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because you all are likely uh, you know just a quick glance at the at the participants here a minute ago. Uh, y'all are probably the more more likely to be. Uh, for example, experiencing um, sexism uh, and and to a, to a lesser extent racism and and heterosexism based on who I quickly glanced at in the list. Um, it, male musicians tend not to believe us when we say that something bad has happened, and tend to disregard or downplay whatever has happened. Oh, sure, you know, he didn't really mean to slap you on the ass while you were washing dishes. Really? You think? Uh, so, uh, if you see something, say something. There's also a big thing that I think at the moment, those of us who are white allies, we, we tend not, we tend to think that we know what is going to help. And we don't always know what's going to help. So we should ask. We should ask our friends of color. We should ask, you know, if you're straight, uh, mm -hmm. ask p queer people, you know, ask, ask what will help. Because sometimes uh, visibility is really important, but hyper visibility is also a violence. And so it's not every time that somebody wants that. Um, Tess, yeah. I don't know if you've come across the work of Emma Debiri. She is from Dublin. She has a, a Nigerian and Irish heritage. And she's, you know, working on the BBC, doing her PhD, has written a number of books, but she just brought a, out a book called um, uh, What, you know, What White People Can Do, basically, From Allyship mm -hmm. to Coalition. And she speaks very specifically to that 1990s forward experience of being sometimes the only uh, Black girl mm -hmm. in her school. And uh, it's a small book, uh, but there's great prescription in it. And I would I would uh, recommend everybody, everybody have a read. I'm just seeing two questions coming in, Tess. One from Anne-Marie Hanlon, who thanks you for your fantastic research in Trad Nation and opening up that proverbial can of worms. It was an act of bravery, absolutely. Your work asks many difficult questions that requires a form of introspection that can be difficult for people of Irish ethnicity to face, absolutely. Um, how do you feel about the commercialization of Irish traditional music, especially its bankability and tourism? How might that impact our ability to have these honest conversations? You know, it it's weird in a way, but I think it might actually make it easier because when things are commercialized, they are texts. Um, there's there's not a lot of um, privacy issues around. You know, if I want to critique, for example, that cork video that I showed at the beginning, I feel very very free to critique that because I know that it was staged. I know that that people were brought together for a reason, and I know that this is a an object for public consumption. Mm -hmm. 
I might make some of the same observations about other things and I and I have done you know there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that but uh, socially I think it's a little difficult difficult sometimes when you are going to your your local every week session and then you're suddenly saying okay so why am I the only woman here or, or whatever the situation happens to be but when it's a commercial text then you can say okay let's let's read this text and that that gives a certain freedom um, you know, of course, we always have to be conscious because it's such a small scene. And we all know, like, probably most of us in this video know somebody who's in that cork video. So like, you know, there, there is that there's, there's a sensitivity. But um, again, I, I think we, we are, we are in a new and different stage than we were even 10 years ago, um, with the level of comfort in saying something. And I think that the the conversations around larger public events and you know just things that are happening in the news we're in a really different position to say something and and so my hope is that folks who are um who are not necessarily affected by whatever the oppression at hand or oppressions at hand happen to be uh will start feeling more comfortable to say something and and una monahan's work here i think really really stands out where she has interviewed so many women musicians. Um, you know, the the way that Twitter has has changed the conversation with Misha Fosta. So um, if if anybody, let's see, I don't know if we have the ability to put things in, it, in the chat that everybody can see, but um, check out your Twitter, like hang out on Twitter because it's really educational. And um, absolutely, there's uh, some more things coming in here from Amy Mulligan, who says some very nice stuff that you can read later. Um, and she wants to talk about the idea of uh, the the reproductive metaphors is something that she knows a lot about in terms of our medieval work. So Amy is in, in Notre Dame and does some some great stuff in this area and on Chicago uh, as well. So this idea of, uh, you know, pregnancy, gestation, uh, can you talk a little bit more about those kinds of uh, metaphors that we get in the discourse? I would love to. Um, and, and actually, Amy, I would love to talk at some point, maybe separately, because I'd, I'd love to hear more about what you do. Um, so the term tradition bearer is it has a really interesting etymology or not etymology, but yeah, whatever, um, where the it, it really gets currency right around the time the eugenics movement is starting to to really become a thing in the, the 1930s. And I haven't fully traced the, the use of this term, but it's, um, it, it is very much connected with the idea of ethnic nationalism of, you know, I, I think that some of the people who first used it wouldn't necessarily have considered themselves to be eugenicists, but, but there is a connection there. And so, um, it it really just throws into huge relief the idea that that these metaphors are well that 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 this is a metaphor that is really um talking about the bearing of actual children and and children who are genetically encoded in whatever ways they are um let's see i'm kind of spinning out with this answer a little bit so um What do I want to say here more? Um, so do I see it in other places other than the term tradition bearer? Well, there's definitely, have, yeah, I lineage. I mean, my music lineage. came from, there's a real yeah. lineage. I mean, we, we do a real begats thing. <laughs> like I got this tune from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so. Uh, so we've got we've got the sense of this lineage with tunes. Yeah. Okay. Another thing is tune families. People talk about tune families. Uh, the shared and I've actually heard it said the shared genetic material of tunes. Um, I mean, I get itchy anytime somebody says our shared DNA of whatever. Um, but but this idea that 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 there that that it's genetic like that that comes into to the classification of tunes as well. Uh, I'm going to stop there, though. Yeah, there is a very interesting um, uh, question coming in from Chuyua Ho 
Tess, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, I've not a very well framed question, I'm sure it's fine. It's to do with artistic production and the racialized body. In the paper, you talked about how a non-white Irish bodies externalize the limits of their musical expertise and authenticity. There's also this other argument or essentialist assumption that there are categories of people who have this innate musical ability to express themselves in non-verbal communication uh, because they are not being considered as rational under the Western Enlightenment framework, absolutely, especially with um, um, black bodies. In this case, most have natural music talents, are black or people of color, whereas white people are literal and not natural in expressing their music or musical talents that are learned um, and part of culture. How would you describe the relationship between the kinds of essentialist assumptions you mentioned in your paper and this other one that goes in the opposite direction, but is essentially based on the same premise? Hey, Choi, well, it's so awesome to see you here. Um, Okay, so, you know, I think that it's um, that that whole thing about the the embodied ability that doesn't come from any kind of learning and it just is and that that lives in the bodies of people of color. Fascinatingly, and I and I wonder and I haven't really thought about this. I haven't thought through this completely, but if this is connected with Ireland's post colonial status that Irish musicians, including men, including straight white men, will talk about being, you know, like the idea, like this idea about um, innate musical ability. This is this is coded into the idea of Irish ethnicity as well. And and it gets, you know, interestingly, I think this is part of what what gets used to exclude people who are not of Irish descent even though it's ironically excluding the people who most usually have that fallacy of innate ability put onto them. Um, so, so it's, it's a, it's a sticky, interesting, and I need to think a lot more about that because that your question is making me think I had not thought about this at all, um, about how this, how this kind of works together with ideas about Irishness and ability. Um, but, but just the stories of like Aileen, you, <laughs> you and I could probably regale everybody of stories of like, I'm just thinking about the stories of Padraig O'Keefe mm -hmm. and about how he was like this kind of supernatural being in, in some ways. Um, and, and I do talk about that a little bit in, in my book about, um, talent being seen to be supernatural. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a little different from, in fact, that is a little different from embodied ability through the fact of the body. Yeah, and yeah, and I mean, I think people like Helen O'Shea, you know, ha have written about this in the making of Irish music. I mean, the kind of discourses of the the Irish as innately musical. It's it's you know, everybody brings up Gerald of Wales, Haraldus Cambrinus, talking about the colonial project, and the only thing he'd give to Irish people was a musicality. That that becomes part of a public and a civic discourse that then feeds into uh, responses that are about, well, I'm a Hegarty. Ergo, I believe yeah. connect. Um, um, there, there was a, an addendum to that question, which is how do the, these two assumptions manifest in the trad music scene you are investigating? And in a way, I think maybe your paper has addressed that already. Though I should say, Hajime is an interesting example because he did the BA in Irish music uh, in the Irish World Academy. And, uh, you know, people were initially kind of fetishizing his presence mm -hmm. as a Japanese man playing this music. But by the time he was in fourth year, uh, people just wanted to, to play with him because he was that damn good. Mm -hmm. and, and and so he's, you know, that that thing disappeared. But this idea that you will constantly be judged first uh, is an interesting one. I'm going to ask, um, Ryan has an interesting question here. Is there a counter discourse in Irish traditional music that grounds belonging not in some connection to Irish ancestry or ethnicity, but to shared knowledge and embodied skill, or do the ethno-nationalist assumptions too often foreclose, foreclose this alternative? Just before you answer that, Tess, can I direct <laughs> you Ryan to Felix Morgenstern's uh, recently finished PhD that does precisely this, uh, focuses on knowledge and embodied skill, but it's complicated. Tess. <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah. So yeah, that that counter discourse definitely is, is part of things. And, and I would say that that counter discourse is getting more prevalent than it certainly than it was when I started playing when I was in my 20s in the 90s. Um, and, you know, just speaking for myself, I 
I made a very conscious choice. And I, I, haven't, I don't know if I've told a lot of people this, um, but at one point it would have been, it would have been a few years out of college. So it would have been the late nineties. And I was starting to actually, no, it was my first longer trip to Ireland, which would have been 98. And I got a, a grant from Cultus in Washington, DC to, to go. And the, the way that I got the grant, uh, actually, no, that was the second, the second time I, I went over anyway. Um, mildly important detail, but I thought to myself, my last name is Slominski. My mother is in fact, not Irish. I mean, I Scottish. Yes. Like, I mean, but they go so far back, it doesn't even count. So, um, not Irish at all. And so getting taken seriously as a player was really hard in the U S I was less hard in Ireland at the time and I was still learning. So I wasn't all that good. Um, so I, I didn't have that to kind of fall back on. But at one point I thought, Hmm, one way for me to get taken more seriously is to try to carve out a niche to try to, um, identify myself with a regional style. And so I, I choose Schlieve Lucra, which was very, very undervalued at the time. Nobody wanted to be playing polkas and slides. They were the most abject kind of music you could possibly play, but the dancers wanted them. The DC local dan dancers wanted polkas and slides. Of course they did. So I said, right, I'll go over to, to Cork and Carry, and I'll get a bunch of polkas and slides and I will bring them back so that you all will have new polkas played in a decent style uh, to dance to. And they thought this was a great idea altogether. It gave me some money to go to Ireland the second time. So, um, so that, that, that kind of idea of claiming a regional style, which I did very consciously and, and part of it was unconscious because I really legitimately adore that music. Like I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have gotten this far with it if I didn't really adore that music. But, um, that, that was a very strategic thing at first was for me to be able to, um, you know, Ryan, as you say, to ground my belonging in a particular knowledge that was not at this point, at, you know, back in the nineties was not widely known in the U S. Um, so I will say that it worked. And so in that case, it, it didn't foreclose on the alternative. Although if I were not white, it probably would have, especially at the time. So, um, you know, I, I did benefit tremendously from having people like, you know, I had professors who just assumed that of course my mother must be Irish, that my father was obviously some other things, Pol Polish, you know, but that my mother would be Irish and that I would be just fine. And so that, you know, the whiteness there is the key. Um, guys, I'm going to take one brief more question because we need to start wrapping it up. We were meant to stop at uh, eight at um, three o'clock, but I can see how engaged you all are. And, uh, you know, we need to do this again uh, sometime. Um, lovely comments from Joanne Cusack, just thanking you for a great presentation and for asking those questions. Patrick has a really interesting question, and this is the last one. Uh, he enjoyed your book immensely. Do you see a role for Irish language as part of dealing with some of these issues in terms of bilingualism? You know, this is, this is anecdotal. It's only my own experience, but I have, you know, the, the, the problems and the exclusions I have noticed or experienced, um, have never come from Irish speakers. And I think that there's a shared, there, there's a sense of, I don't know. Um, there, there's a marginalization there that I think leads to a certain kind of perspective that I do think is a really great window into um, into thinking about a more expansive understanding within the music. And so um, my, my short answer is yes, I, I think there's a huge role. Um, and I think especially as, as more people from outside Ireland or, or without Irish uh, ethnic heritage are learning Irish, you know, I, I see this being a win-win situation um, where, where there's the possibility for engagement and connection that, and then also helping with language preservation, which I think is a, a there's a, 
dire need for that. You know, that Irish language cannot disappear because it's such a fantastic language. I mean, just, and, and so, you know, the fact that I'm talking mostly about, <clears throat> about tunes and not about song and dance and not about Shannos, I, I think it's not for nothing that we're seeing um, Shannos singers who are not of Irish ethnic descent. You know, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, well, Tess, thank you for a really uh, super presentation and uh, getting these great questions from people. Um, we're very grateful for all of you who stuck around past the hour mark and especially to Tim, who has taken care, took care of us all so well in terms of tech. I did propose to him, but he told me he was married already. So I just have to, I don't know, find another tech guy. Uh, Mary Hendrickson, Mary, thank you for liaising with us, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction. It's lovely to see so many of the faculty. Uh, Patrick Griffin, hello to uh, so many people there. Liz Carl, the amazing Liz Carl, a great uh, friend to both of us. Um, Liz, thanks for being here. Uh, and for those of you I don't know, thanks also for being here. I know Tess has lots of friends here as well. There's an appetite for this. Um, uh, we need to keep talking, we need to keep researching, and we need not just to be allies, but also uh, to, to form coalitions. And small behaviours make all the difference. It doesn't have to be aggressive. And can I just close by saying woke is a compliment. It's not a bad thing to be, okay? Um, Tess, uh, if you have any final words. Um, Tim said, would you like to play out the third video as we as we leave? If you want to tell people what that third video is, and we can close the session. We, we could do that for sure. And thank you all for being here. And oh my gosh, Liz, you're here. I'm, I'm having a moment, so please forgive me. But thank you, as Aileen said, thanks to everybody uh, who has helped make this possible. Um, and Aileen, thank you so much for your your wonderful words which i do not get to hear nearly often enough and uh we need to add more hours in the day so that i can so that we can talk more and and also so that i can talk to all y'all who are out there in the audience that i also don't get to talk to nearly enough or play with so uh so yeah we're gonna play y'all out with the grand finale from the online dublin pride 2020 um gaily G E. I L I. And the, the Gaily has been part of Dublin Pride now for some years. Uh, I played for one in person in Dublin in 2015. Uh, it's, it's always been a very expansive thing. Uh, the video, the longer version of the video, which is on YouTube, has a lot of allies in there as well. Um, I had hoped we would have a little bit of time to kind of talk through this video because there, it brings up some issues but it's also just a really good time. So I, I think it's a great way to, um, to send you all off into the world. And also I encourage you to go look it up and um, send me your thoughts. I, I have a slide somewhere with my, um, yeah, I think my contact you info, but we, you won't be able to see it because you'll be watching the video. So, um, so yeah. I can always That's tweet. Flaminski at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Stay safe, wear a mask. We have to say goodbye from all of us here, but most importantly, we want to say this has been Pride, and this has been Dublin Pride, the outing festival here in Pantybar, but most importantly, a big thank you to all our artists and performers from the USA, of course, Scotland, the UK, and here in Ireland, we want to say, Thank you to our trad musicians. We love you, and of course, we're spreading the love. This has been Pride. This is the Gaily. Slunlash. One, two, three.